where can you get coral frags for 99 cents? eBay, of course, right? The better question is where can you get healthy, colorful coral for 99 cents? The answer is still eBay, but you want to look for the top shelf aquatic posts on eBay. Approximately a week or so ago, they started offering a lot of their corals from their farm on eBay. And again, we've seen their farm through the videos. Basically, they've got beautiful, healthy, colorful corals, tons of selections. And so they started basically using eBay as another route where you can buy their corals. Again, something definitely worth checking out. Now, what are we going to talk about on this episode of American Reef? Eradicating velvet in your saltwater fish tank. I'm Russ Kickel. And stick around for another episode of American Reef. So this is another update video with Roger. Um, those of you who don't know, Roger is basically uh, Tunzi USA. Right? And uh, long story made short, Roger got a new fish tank when he got a new house. Right? And in that process, right, there were some things that he was trying to solve with his original fish tank. This conversation talks about not only how he solved them, but also some of the issues that he had. One of them was velvet, right, on, his, uh, on the fish in the tank. And there are just a ton of little nuggets of information that are very useful in here. One of them, for example, when he was uh, basically quarantining the fish, right, and medicating them, he used a cooler, basically, to provide that kind of quarantine location. Well, think about it. A cooler is insulated, right? You can keep it dark by closing the lid. You got a little plug on the bottom if you want to do your water changes. I mean, there's just all kind of really cool benefits of using a regular, you know, kind of outdoor cooler for a quarantine system. And again, that was just one of many little tricks that he's sharing in this video. So that's going to be the topic of this video. Um, you know, since we're talking about kind of nuisance things in this hobby, you'll find out uh, there's two videos, uh, again, from typical premium aquatics and bulk reef supply, right, that kind of talk about these nuisance, um, we'll say, um, what would they be? I don't want to say activities, but occurrences that occur in reef tanks. One of them from bulk reef supply is basically... Um, you know, controlling nitrates and phosphates, right? Everybody has talked about them before, but they started up a new video series talking about kind of uh, some repercussions of these ultra-low nutrient tanks, right? Um, things that weren't necessarily proven to be accurate with, we'll say, um, the previous thought processes of uh, the people in the hobby, right? Especially some of the advanced, you know, aquarists in the hobby. Um, the second video, basically, we're talking flatworms. Again, this is Premium Aquatics, and what they did in their tank series is they actually talk about flatworms, and they actually show, uh, basically, some nudibranchs and what they do to those flatworms. So, again, two kind of pesky situations that we all deal with as hobbyists, and two great videos that kind of can set you on the right path. So, to that point, if, uh, if you're looking for something great to watch, check them out on YouTube. Again, that's the Premium Aquatics channels as well as the Bulk Reef channel. And now, to that point, let's spin up uh, this video with Roger and let's hear how he's talking about curing velvet as well as tank moves and all that fun stuff. <music> Roger, thank you. This is what? Times two, right? Our second attempt. 
<laughs> yeah, the second attempt on this one. I think it's the third interview in total, or the <laughs> aquarium interview. But but yeah, it's good to be back. How are you doing, uh, Russ? Always good when we're talking. You know that. Oh, thanks. So, so hold on. Now, a lot has has transpired, right? Like just in yeah. your life, like that again from a from a viewer perspective since last time we talked, right? Sure. Um, whether that's you know. You got a, a new home and moved a tank, right? You had yeah. ups and downs with all that. Then you had COVID, you know, from for your day job kind of stuff. So, uh, let, well, let's let's hit that first. How ha from a COVID perspective, right? How has that affected, uh, you know, again, just Tunzi as it relates to the U.S. and you know, just global kind of operations. I mean, where we are, you know, pets were considered essential pet businesses. We stayed open. Mm -hmm. We did, you know, take some precautions and, and, you know, essentially we rotated through the office. So only one of us was here at a time. I'd go in early. We'd start typing up the orders and getting them ready. Next guy would come in and pull them and pack them. And then the last guy would wait for shipping. That way everybody got some hours and some work. And then in between, you know, work from home. Um, but we went through that, through the worst of it, when they were doing the, the lockdowns here in Texas. And um, everybody came through okay. And, you know, ever since we've been open. And, uh, um, you know, the biggest issue for us has been just the, the whole supply chain disruption, getting things in. Um, you know, the same as throughout most of the industry, shipping is very expensive now because there's uh, just fewer international flights. There's fewer um, international ships. And uh, there's, a, you know, everything just costs more to move. And so that's, that's another hurdle. <clears throat> but, you know, it, it did give me a little more time at home to work on the aquarium. And uh, I, I've added a lot of fish. I mean, we, we moved last year. I mean, not, not the business, but my house. I, I moved to a new house. And I upgraded to a new 265-gallon uh, aquarium. And uh, I got a big, nice sump from, uh, I got one of those pro sumps from My Reef Creations, that's the white PVC, and uh, set it all up with, with, you know, I think the best tons of equipment, uh, the 9430 skimmer and one of the large MAR reactors, it's a, a prototype one, and I have the 3172 calcium reactor. Um, and I've been very happy with everything. But, you know, anytime you move, things don't always go right. I, I, had, uh, I had a velvet outbreak, lost all my fish, um, restocking. I, you know, COVID hit while I was restocking. So um, <clears throat> I've been working with um, Elliot Lamb and Marine Collectors to restock my tank because I decided... You know, BRS always talks about them. And I was like, you know, that's that's what I want to do. I want to get my fish all pre-quarantined. I don't want to take any more chances. I mean, obviously, somewhere in the past, they did something wrong. And, uh, you know, it showed up in the move. And so, and that was a first for me. I didn't even realize that you could maintain velvet like you can ick. That it's possible to have it latent in your system. And... Um, you know, these fish are fat and healthy and things are stable and they're fine and all of a sudden you move and things go downhill. And it happened so slowly, I couldn't believe it was velvet. It wasn't the, you know, two days later they're dead. It's like, they look kind of dull. They're not eating right, you know, and this went on for over a week and it's like, what's wrong with them? You know, you just say, I'm looking through, it's like, I'm like it's gotta be something fairly obscure, Brooklynella, you know, something I'm not thinking of and um, turned out to be velvet, but I didn't realize it until too late. So Elliot tells me, you know, I, I'm thinking, let's start with all the really docile fish I want, and then let's work our way up to adding the tangs last. And uh, he's like, I would do the opposite of that. And I'm like, well, explain this to me. He's like, well, if, if you know, think of it that the tang's going to be the most sensitive fish you add. Do you want to find out that you didn't beat the velvet on the first fish? Or do you want to wait till your, your tank's fully stocked and lose everything again, potentially? So they're like, okay, that makes sense. So the first fish in, I decided this time I would go with an Achilles tank. And um, 
that worked fine, but now I've got this Achilles tang and the clock's kind of ticking. It's like, we got to get the other stuff in here before he takes, you know, takes the whole tank as his territory and there's no way I can add anything else. And, um, you know, then by then we're in full lockdowns, fish are scarce if at all available, nobody's shipping. So then I just started, it's like, okay, I got to find people I got fish. I gotta, so, so then I'm, I'm adding things with a lot less caution than I should have added. I had another velvet outbreak. And this time, by now I had, uh, I had the Achilles, I had a couple of potters, uh, potter's angels, and I had a couple of some of artist butterflies. So, um, this time though, I knew what I was dealing with. I caught it right away. I, uh, I set up a cooler. I was like, you know, I got this big cooler. I was like, this will be a good quarantine tank because I can close the lid, it's dark and uh, it's insulated. I'll put a heater in there. I have this little Eheim internal filter I dropped in there and uh, it worked. I, I just used Odinex and treated basically copper treatment. And uh, I'm, then I had to keep them in there though for six weeks to essentially fallow the tank. And I made it through that. So, uh, you know, I, I did some stupid things in the interim. I, I had these um, I, I wanted to get the fish back into the tank. You know, I'm like, every day they're in this cooler, it's a risk. You know, it's not a full life support system. I, I really like to try to accelerate this. And I'm talking to people like Elliot and other experts, and they're like, yeah, wait, don't, don't do anything stupid. But, you know, that temptation was too great, and I was like, I bet, you know, I'm reading all these articles about hydrogen peroxide and how it can change, like, I bet you I could just dump a bunch of hydrogen peroxide in my tank and it'll kill the velvet and then I can add the fish back. And, um, you know, my logic was, I was reading how, you know, if you're at 50 ppm for this long, velvet can't live. I'm reading all these studies and all these tests. And it's like, if I had, you know, full pint of hydrogen peroxide and I'll, I'll hit this number, there's going to be so many organics in the tank that it's going to break down really fast and I'll only be there for a little while. The corals will be okay. <laughs> and it did not go as planned. <laughs> so, but amazingly, the, the everything pulled through. I, I actually, it's funny, you know, at, at the time, I woke up that next morning, I was like, holy crap, I wiped out all my corals. Everything, it looked like a curio shop. Everything was snow white. I was like, what? I, I mean, this is just the dumbest thing I've ever done. <clears throat> and, you know, I have that Ritter eye anemone that I've had for a few years. And, I mean, it, you don't see that color variety. I got it from uh, un Unlimited Color Corals, and it was one of those Indonesian ones that, you know, they just don't come in anymore. And um, so I, I, the anemone had mesentery filaments stuck out everywhere. I was like, oh, God, what? It, it, but amazingly, within a few days, everything pulled through. Even those bleach white corals, they started to color up again. I, I think I had four or five acros that I wrote off as goners, and now here we are. I think, I think that it passed like six, seven months ago. And just little tiny polyps left on the rocks have grown back into new colonies. So I think all said and done, I lost like two corals to that. So... Yeah, you can't you can't argue with those kind of results when you think you got nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, well it just shows you, you know, the the past I probably would have been I'm just gonna throw everything away and start over and I was like right. now nah, let's see what happens. Let's let's wait this out. Something you know and I mean it it you know, I, I talked to you about how I'm battling this um bryopsis problem now. Right, right. And that, that was one of the consequences of that was that, you know, I, I nuked so many things and liberated all these nutrients into the system and then they bound a rock, they bound a sand and I'm having these little clumps of, of uh, bryopsis algae. But I, I've been hesitant to do anything more aggressive than just mechanically remove it and try some bacterial additives. I'm using the Tunzi Care Bacter and uh, just wait it out. And my reasoning there is is that I already really screwed things up looking for a quick fix. Let's not try, let's not try for round two. So I, uh, 
and I, yeah, I'm admittedly from past experience terrified of, of bryopsis because I've had it just take over tanks, you know, going back 15, 20 years. It, it used to be one of those things that would just get you out of the hobby. I mean, it, it would just take over an aquarium. But uh, I've, I've gained ground on it, and it's actually pretty under control now, so. Knock it on wood. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to your point, right? Okay, so uh, I have a million questions. Um, sure. So first of all, when you got the new tank, first of all, because yeah. right? we're going to go back and go through it. Um, did you end up keeping all of the live rock, the sand, and everything that you had, or did you replace it? What did you do? I, I dumped the sand. I, I started with all new sand. I didn't see any point in keeping old sand. Um, I, I kept, you know, all the corals I moved. I think there were a couple that I was like, you know, I, I remember I had a couple of um, caps that, you know, monopora capricornis mm -hmm. that I just wasn't that impressed with. You know, there's some of those corals that you look at on a website and they look great. <laughs> and then it's like, it only looks that good under like straight blue light. Right. Otherwise, it's like, nah. It's you know, it's three shades of cream and brown. It's not really that neat. So, so there were a few like that. That's like I'm trading that in. You know, they, just put leave that space for something nicer. Um, but I moved all, and then I moved some of the rock. But I actually redid the. I, you know, in the past I'd used, um, well, I, I'd wanted to, you know, I've watched different people, the BRS tanks and uh, some of the, um, Joe Caparetta does a lot of it with unique corals. Mm -hmm. They use that Marco rock. Mm -hmm. And I really liked how you had these nice flat shelves. It was almost like working with bricks. And they have that, uh, that E Marco mortar. And it, it really was just like working with bricks. I was like, this is how I can build a scape that, that I really like. And, um, you know, without the... Most rocks, are, they're too irregular. You know, you build something, it leans, it falls over. Right. It's like if I mortar it all together, have these nice flat sections, I can build something stable that'll stay and, um, and get a scape I really like. So... I, I started with pretty much all new rock. I kept a few pieces that had corals growing on them and to kind of seed things. Um, all new sand. I moved over about a third of the water. And, um, you know, but having the corals and everything, I think there was quite a bit there to seed it. And, and also taking the water. So now, did you have the tank set up in your new house where you just kind of ported things over or did you, how'd you do that? Yeah, I, I had everything set up in the new house ready to go and just had to move the move everything over. Beautiful. And no surprises? No, I mean, uh, you know, moving, when the tank showed up, you know, I mean, that was, I, I had an unpleasant issue. You know, that's one of those things, hindsight being twenty twenty. This thing shows up in a big crate, it, you know, it, it was all three quarter inch glass, the crated weight was like 850 pounds. Um, so then, you know, uncrated, you're still at like 700 pounds. We're, we roll this thing in, it's me and three guys, we can't lift it. We're just like, you know, we, we've got the suction cups, we got everything, but we're, we can, we can kind of like get it up, but you just can't, all the way up onto the stands, a whole other. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so we were just like, yeah, we're gonna have to re retry with get a couple more people over here. But rolling it in, I chipped the top edge of the glass, and it, it was uh, the dollies started rolling. They kind of got some momentum coming down the sidewalk, and the door closed a little bit, and the door hit, knob hit it. And it's like, you know, if only I would have just removed the dang door. It's right. like, why did <laughs> three pins pop them off? I mean, this would have been easy. Why didn't I? <laughs> Hindsight, though, right? Yeah. So, so you're going, <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, you know, but it's, it's like it, it chipped out like just like it, it was almost like a like a knife blade. You know, just took out this little chip. Okay. Like, you know, it's on the very top. I put a, I 
basically I just kind of regrouped. I was like, I'll, I'll get some nice colored acrylic and make a decorative trim strip around it. Mm-hmm. Fill it in with some polyurethane resin where the chip is. And that, that worked just fine. I mean, so. So I was going to ask. kind of, you know, adapt and overcome as they say. It. <laughs> so then to that point, once you kind of got your tank there, right, um, with, and you said you saved about, about a third of the water? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, and did you have, you had inhabitants, right? Yeah. Uh, and those, they, so essentially what I was doing was I would take over like 50 gallons of water at a time mm-hmm. and, and as I was doing water changes. So, you know, the, the old tank got quite a few water changes while I set up the new tank. Sure. And that was, that was my process to, to get some old right. water to seed things. Good idea. So then, okay, from the time you got your tank, we'll say, in place, from the time you actually, again, have fish swimming in there, how, how many days, weeks? Uh... I waited two weeks. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, I started filling it up and moving things over. I kind of figured, well, the bacteria, give it a couple of weeks to kind of multiply and spread. Um, I remember one weekend I moved, you know, some of the old rocks and corals and just kind of more or less like a test, you know, sure. well, everything looks okay, the corals are opening, things look good, so sure. then I proceeded a week after that to move everything over. And when you were doing that, again, you said you got rid of the sand, you put new sand in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I still have that turtle grass, so, you know, I yeah. needed a section of the deep sand bed. Yep. And uh, did you mix Miracle Mud in this time? Or I no? did. You did? Yeah, I, okay. I, and quite a bit this time. I used, uh, I don't remember what the portion size is, but the larger clear jar of right, it. Right, right. Or no, it, actually it was, it, it was the, the, the bag. I think it was okay. like a five pound bag. Is that, is that a, I yep. think that's the size. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, did you just put it in the one section where the turtle grass is? Just, just yeah. where the turtle grass is. Because, yeah, I'm mainly using it as like a nutrient substrate for it. I put a little bit, I have that black mangrove that grows out of that little delta rock, the mangrove rock. Right. I put like a fistful of it in there, too, just to kind of give sure. the mangrove some nutrients. Sure, sure. Yeah, the whole remineralization <clears throat> kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, okay, so you do that. And then, when did you first discover the whole velvet thing? Well, so probably two two weeks in. Okay. The first thing that I saw was that the semilavartis butterfly I'd had started to like bloat up, and and so I was like, I figured it was just some kind of you know diet related issue, something removing. I'd take them out of the tank. Uh, fortunately. It's pretty easy to catch, you know. I could. I that was one of the things I learned through this whole thing was that if I take a, a high-powered flashlight that strobes mm-hmm. and set it on the strobe, and you know, you have to do it in the dark at night when the fish aren't expecting you. Which for me, I, I learned was actually I'm usually up around six in the morning or a little before, and so the fish, even though the lights are still off, they know, you know, hey. He starts messing with the tank, he's feeding the corals, you put a little uh, refroids in there or something for the corals every morning. I, the lights are on in the kitchen, so they're already kind of, even though the lights aren't on on the tank, they're already right. kind of up and have a routine. So to catch the fish, he actually, it, it was like four in the morning, I'd have to get up to, to really catch them off guard to where they were just asleep in a hole somewhere, and then you'd stun them with this strobing flashlight. Right. And um, I could scoop them out easily that way. And so the Semilov artist, I had pretty good luck with, with the bloating. I would take them out. I would mix up. I, I was under the assumption it was, it was like some sort of uh, constipation, something like that. Mm-hmm. So I was mixing up more or less a freshwater bath with some Epsom salt. You know, and it wasn't, it was more like brackish water. I took some aquarium water in there too, so I could leave them for a longer bath. Mm -hmm. And I put Cipro in there, figuring maybe it's bacterial. And I'd do one of these dips, he'd take a big poop, and then he'd be like back in the tank and 
you know, start shrinking back down and looking good. And I was like, you know, hey, I'm beating this. And, uh, but then the other fish started acting weird. And, and then it was like the, you know, I, I, I beat the one battle, but it, it just, things just weren't going right. But that was my first sem- sign that there was something wrong. Right. Um, <clears throat> And then the other thing that really threw me was the tangs were the last thing to, to get sick. And, you know, you'd figure the tangs would be first to go. Sure. But see, the weird thing there was I had moved the, I had the tangs living in the sump. And I think the lack of light, and, you know, I, I always run a UV, so mm-hmm. I think that I kind of kept it in check. The sump is dark, so the velvet probably couldn't really do as well in there. Um, but yeah, I kept the tangs in the sump because I thought, well, I'll add some new fish since I got this bigger tank and then I'll move the tangs back into the main right. tank once that's done so that they don't beat everybody up. At the time I had a, a powder blue and he was super aggressive and right. I have found fortunately the Achilles when they're, you know, a little bit bigger Achilles is a, I think a more peaceful fish than a powder blue. Really? Yeah. I don't know why, but in my mind, Achilles were always kind of more more with an attitude than a powder. The, I mean, my experience with this one um, is been, has been that they're they're about the same the the first few days. Mm-hmm. It's the persistence. The the powder blue is like I'm not giving up until you're dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the attacks never let up. It's relentless. It's it's a constant. Yeah bully and uh, the Achilles is more like you know three days past he's like man eh, whatever right you know there's enough food for all of us just stay out of my corner <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know and it's funny you mention that because n- n- now that you uh, that you say that I had an issue with my one tank tank where you know one of the yellow ones for whatever reason had an issue and uh, yeah, the powder blue would just constantly day after day after day, yeah. right? And to your point, one time I actually, it was early in the morning, I actually had my algae scraper. He was underneath a rock, right? I was able to go under with an algae scraper, literally lift him up like a pancake, all right? Because he was just that beat up and dead, so to speak. And I threw him into the, uh, into the sump and... and Four days later, without getting beat up constantly, he was like, hey, life is good again, right? Uh-huh. And it was funny, though, because, you know, again, I got him all healthy, life is great, you know. And, and and I gave him, I'll say, well, I don't know, probably two weeks, just to, you know, life is good, he's good. So then I took a piece of uh, egg crepe, put it in a corner of the tank, and said, well, I'll, I'll still reacclimate you that way, that way... You know, the other fish kind of get used to them. Anyway, nobody paid him any attention. Life was beautiful. I popped the egg crate, and within five seconds, that pot of blue comes over and goes, You again? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, I remember the, the one I had. I mean, I, I tried everything, you know, to add fish. I, I even tried the mirror on the tank. Yes. And it, it, I swore the fish was going to have, like, an aneurysm. I mean, he, he had turned, like, this you know colors i had never seen him turn before like dark blue and white stripes right. and just the most aggressive and he's just flaring up at this mirror it's like you're gonna kill yourself i mean it's <laughs> right to your point oh such the attitude wow well so okay so from your side of it then um going back into again you know you you looked at it and everything kind of from from that whole valve side things weren't acting right, right? Yeah. and then when did you finally say okay that's it, it, it it's time I mean how, how how many weeks did you kind of play with that a little bit oh I mean the, on the second outbreak or the yeah I mean the second one once once I, I saw it on the fish that I re-added after after going fallow and everything I, I pretty much within two three well that's actually, I, I did try to, um, you know, I, I basically was like, how am I going to get these fish out of here? You know, and I I toyed around with, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide dosing. 
I got a bigger UV. I mean, I think for all told, I, I probably played around for about a week mm -hmm. before I was like, look, I can't face my wife and say, like, all these fish I just spent money on again. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to spend that money again because they all died. And, you know, she'd be like, yeah, I think you're done. <laughs> But, you know, find some other hobby, golf, something else. <laughs> right. Right. So, right. Find a cheaper ho hobby. <laughs> you know, motorboat racing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Well, and, you know, it's also, it's kind of a personal pride thing, too. I mean, for the most part, I mean, a lot of the fish I, I lost I'd had for a few years. Right. You know, you, you kind of, it's like. The, you do get somewhat of a it's not like a dog but you do get some level of emotional attachment it's like you know wow I grew that thing up the, the last time that thing was injured I, I nursed it back you know and you kind of have this this sense of accomplishment that's like you know rug right. pulled out from under you now I just lost everything I worked for you know? <laughs> right <laughs> so so then in your case then you go and you say okay you're 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 gonna pull it all out, right? Because you don't you're not gonna go through that. Um, did the little the strobe light thing in the wee hours of the morning work for all of them? Yeah, it worked flawlessly. Yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, the Achilles was the hardest one, but he he basically got stunned, and then I could just uh, I I essentially couldn't get a net where he was. Right. But I was able to kind of with one hand coax them out and then scoop them up with the other hand and get them out of there so perfect perfect and then you had a cooler right that you yeah. used as the quarantine tank which yeah. i think is just like ingenious while you were quarantined right did you end up doing water changes and all that sort of stuff yeah, I was trying, you know, like I told you with hydrogen peroxide, I was trying everything right. to accelerate the, you know, fallow period. Right. And, you know, I'd read different articles that, well, in some cases you can fallow a tank from velvet in 30 days. That mainly relied on no light, which I was like, I got all these corals, that, that's not an option. Um, I, I, you know, I dabbled a little bit. So I, you know, one of the things I upgraded in, on my tank was I, I got one of those, uh, I, I bought a Profilux, a GHL Profilux. And so I had a little more feedback on, on what was going on in the system. So I, I thought, well, you know, usually a high pH will help. Um, I put a big, I had a bigger UV. I went from a 50 watt to an 80 watt. I, um, I was able to set up on the Profilux, I have an ozone generator, so I set it up to to run more, and um, then I tried, like I said, the hydrogen peroxide. I actually briefly dabbled with the, um, with. Uh, I, there's articles about it, and I, I hesitate to recommend it, but, you know, there's this bleach dosing thing. Yes. Um, it's, it's intriguing. I mean, the, the chemistry is... is Sound, I think. You know, I mean, you basically are just ending up with oxygen and chloride ions, and it it, it seems like a plausible thing. Um, but and I, I did find that it when the fish were in there, that it it did knock it back. Like I I would see noticeably less spots on them, but it it, it you couldn't beat it with it. Right. Let's say you could kind of. You know, maybe keep it in check by some time. The hydrogen peroxide worked the same way. Right, right. Um, and I, I tried, you know, polyp lab medic. Now, they're all pretty much all the same thing. They're all, you know, some type of oxidizer. Right. <clears throat> so you can buy yourself some time with stuff like that, but you're not going to cure anything. Right. At least not with velvet. So. And so that's where you said you're just going to let it go foul. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's the, you know, it's it's a painful lesson to learn because I mean you know you the whole time I mean the when the fish were in the cooler I was changing it's a it was a thirty gallon cooler I changed half the water every day, remedicate and I was right. doing the the copper nitrofurazone and um, yeah I, I just did the copper and nitrofurazone uh -huh. I think I did do the prazi for a couple of days I yeah. was like yeah there's not not really any point to this so 
And after what period of time did you look at it and go, okay, fish and everybody's are healthy, right? They've they've gotten past the worst part. I I mean I did the copper for four weeks. Okay. Um, and then for the last since I, I, I followed it for six weeks. The last um, couple of weeks I did the copper, you know, that I think the Odinex, since it's like unchelated, it's just straight old fashioned copper sulfate. Right. It seems to be a little less hard on the fish, but they always kind of just don't eat as well when they're in copper. And so I wanted to kind of wean them off of the copper and then I switched to um, Rally, which is acroflavin. Mm -hmm. So I was using that, uh, oh, what's the, Humble Fish. He has that, that dosage instruction for using Rally as a bath. So I, I, I well, it was as a, there was, there's an instruction for a longer term treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, like a, it's a stronger dose, but you're doing it as a separate dip, not in your reef tank. And um, that, that seemed, you know, then they started coming around, they were eating better. And that's when I kind of had the confidence as like, you know, let's, they're, they're, they're doing okay in here without the copper. Right. And, um, you know, in addition to doing the copper once a week, I had two of those coolers. So once a week I would totally shift them over to a new cooler with new water, mm -hmm. new medication. Um, sanitize the equipment, move it over. So I, I, there was a little bit of a tank transfer method in there too, sure, I guess. Sure. <clears throat> now when you say sanitize the equipment, how did you sanitize it? Bleach and water. I would just take everything. I mean, with the, I figured with the nitrofurazone and the medication that I wasn't going to be establishing any bacteria. Right. And that's the other thing that made me really nervous. You know, you're trying to feed them and feed them in moderation, vacuum up all the waste every day, do these big water changes. But without a functioning biological system, you're kind of, things can go south really quick. <laughs> really <laughs> quick, right. <laughs> but in your case, it worked out good then, right? Yeah. So. Um, okay, so <laughs> I can just imagine you have this new tank. You're kind of like sitting there, kind of really wanna. <laughs> I don't know how you did it, cause I, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, you know, it's just uh, you. You don't. I'd already seen the results of uh, of rushing. You know, sure. I I got the refresher course at being an idiot. <laughs> 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 so you don't need to do it out, you know, there's only so many times you can screw up where it's like, okay, now you're just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and especially, too, like, with the whole COVID thing, right? Then that, you know, I mean, in the back of your mind when you think, well, I can always replace, blah, blah, blah. Well, with COVID, you didn't have that, that option yeah. either, too, right? Yeah, and, you know, I mean... <clears throat> I mean, granted, these aren't the most, uh, you know, they're not Dr. Seuss fish or anything, right. but none of these are particularly cheap fish either. Right, right. And, you know, you, you do have an ethical responsibility to try to do everything you can. I mean, right. yeah, things happen, but, you know, if you're aware of what's happening and you've got a way to fix it, you really ought to fix it. So. <laughs> Yeah, that, that would get me going, just in general, right? The whole, yeah. Man, I got all this new stuff. Okay, well, so to that to that point, so when, okay, your, your tank is set up, right? Um, again, you're just, it was what? It was just running with no lights on, no, or it wasn't running? It was, when you say, you know, you let it go, <coughs> did you literally leave it completely go? How did you do that? The when I followed for yes. when the fish were out, yeah. no, I had to have everything running, lights, filter, everything had to be running because I still had the corals in there. Okay. So, so, so you never took a break on again because I know there's like interval kind of uh, treatments that they'll go through where it's kind of like I want to say I remember reading like five days on, five days off. You know, one of these kind of back and forth things, but you didn't do any of that, right? You just let it. No, run. no. The, I mean, the fish stayed in the cooler the full time. Yeah. And the um, and then the the um, the reef tank stayed running. 
you know, I, I told you I tried the hydrogen peroxide to try to nuke the velvet, the right cysts that were in there. I uh, I ran a diatom filter every day, trying to filter them out. Kept the UV running. You know, I tried a bunch of things to try to accelerate it, but right. um, you know, realistically, everybody said you may have helped but be patient don't don't be in a hurry to rush these fish over there because do you really want to do this all over again uh, again right so well how did you know i mean what was the sure sign that you were kind of like Phew. it's all gone and once the fish were in there for a couple of weeks and there was no new outbreak i, I start you know then i increasingly got more confident that i beat it so there was nothing other than that visual confirmation then that's pretty much it yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're sitting there. <laughs> this yeah. today the day, right? <laughs> well, okay. With the tank, then, okay. When I know you were battling that for a while, right? How long has the tank been? Kind of ah, finally, I'm back, right? I I can really enjoy the tank. You know, the, it's probably been about six months. Okay. So. So six months, and so that means you were playing around with it for six to eight. Yeah, about eight months. Yeah. You know, I mean, first I had the the all the fish were, you know, at two weeks to set everything up. Probably about four weeks after that, all the fish died. Um, then I waited like three months before I started restocking. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in. I guess late February when the Achilles went in, mm -hmm. um, and then second outbreak happened probably early April, mm -hmm. and um, then beat that. Had everything back in the tank probably the end of May, and that was that was the. <laughs> it's been running it well since then. Yeah. Um, you know, I, recently I, well, I, I got a doser for the Prophylux. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been dosing anything, though, because part of my school of thought on the on the bryopsis is to keep nutrients yeah, low. And once I've finally beaten that, then I'll set up to dose the yeah. trace elements and aminos. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, but otherwise, I've just been doing mechanical removal and water changes and just trying to get that under control so on the um, on the mechanical side so you, before you had a lot of the hang on back kind of you know gear yeah. right you kind of had that uh, matrix back there um, yeah. so now going to a sump do you find that again it works a little more efficient for you that way or you do less work doing it that way or you know well I mean uh, last weekend I broke down the sump and cleaned everything mm -hmm. you know it had been what 14 months now um, it took like four hours to clean every pump I mean you know taking them apart too I have two mm -hmm. Iwakis that I use as returns just for redundancy uh, there's a pump for the MAR reactor, a pump for the skimmer, a pump for the media reactor, um, and a, a pump for the calcium reactor. Um, you know, I run high magnesium, so that's worked really well to prevent that buildup on stuff. I've been surprised by how well that works. The pumps were relatively clean, all things considered. Mm -hmm. But you, you always have, like, those little tube worms and snails that grow all over everything, those... Uh, you know, you get you get those hard gro growths all over. Right. And then the uh, then you know on top of that, I had to get the mineral buildup off of there. But um, they say I think it's probably more to clean. There you go. But yeah. I, it is. It's interesting how much hot you can almost get the water too clean. Right. I, that's the biggest thing I've struggled with is is keep it, you know getting the nutrients too low, and uh, that that's been a surprise. I, I think in hindsight, I probably would have gone one skimmer smaller. I probably should have gone with the ninety four fifteen. Uh, really, the 
like I found that the, the Kato in that Kato reactor, that's very hit or miss. It, it did really well at first. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually am dosing phosphates now, but very controlled. I, I sure. just put like enough to bring it to 0 0.01 every week. And, right. you know, over the week it comes back down to undetectable. With the the macroalgae reactor, you said it had kind of yeah. highs and lows. Well, you know, I mean, the the K, so the uh, Kato just you know you you can get too low of a nutrient level, and then your Kato right. just crashes. Right. And you can put another handful of Kato in there, and it just crashes. Right, because there's no nutrients. And and so it's uh, you know, I think that once the, I do want to add a few more fish. Um, I've been waiting to, to find, you know, I lost my clowns. I still haven't replaced those. I've been trying to find some good Blackfoot skunk clowns. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those I, those I got uh, captive bred from a friend of mine. And uh, I've been waiting for him to have another batch. Right. So, but he's just a hobbyist breeder. So who knows when that will happen? <laughs> he still has the pair, but you know, it's they may lay eggs, but it's having the uh, okay. I got time now to right. deal with this and raise these up. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so then, you think once you get more fish in there, you'll have more bio load. You might not have more bio those. load, and you know, then I'm also you know I've been more conservative with trying to beat this uh, bryopsis mm -hmm. that that right. creeped up on me, and so I'm not feeding as heavy. Right. You know, I'm feeding once twice a day some days i used to be a three time a day feeder and I, i'll probably go back to that um you know i haven't been dosing trace elements or aminos so all those things play a role too but ever since i set this tank up i've always been at the very low nitrate and phosphate and I, I think that it's just the efficiency of the filter sure sure um you know one thing i've done that's different for most people i mean the the sum's fairly huge it holds uh, it's 42 inches long and 24 inches wide and it's filled about 12 inches deep um so you know there's a fair amount of water in there and it's a fairly large tank but i'm actually using two iwaki 20 rlxts so those are only about five six hundred gallons an hour with the head pressure mm -hmm. and so it's it's got a fairly slow flow rate you know most people would do a lot more than that through right. that sump and it, it could handle it but i've always believed if you put the water through there more slowly the filter works better and i think when the water is rushing through there if you have filter socks and that you're essentially just pounding all that stuff into tea and, and pounding it into the, the water right, right. so i i I generally like the lower flow rate through the sump. Yeah, I know. And then for flow in the tank, I've got those four stream threes. Two mm -hmm. of them are set up to make a wave. Two of them are just set up to make a steady pulsed flow in the tank. Uh, and that's worked really well, too. And so. now, how, as far as the stream threes, how do you have them laid out in the tank? Two of them are on the overflow box. One's facing left, one's facing right, and they're mm -hmm. stacked right on top of each other. And those are the two that make a wave, so mm -hmm. they just kind of alternate. Mm -hmm. And when one's on, the other one's off, and that mm -hmm. kind of gets that wave action going. Yeah. Um, and then the other two are set up in the corners, and they're set up with the flow deflectors on and blast across the tank. So. Got it. Got it. And is that the only flow that you have for that circulation other than, yeah. you know, your return pumps? Good deal. Yeah. Um, I remember you saying you also changed the lights on this tank, right? Yeah. I, I, uh, so when I moved, you know, I had the 360 WEs and the solar tubes. Right. And I, I had uh, um, Reef Bright. XHO strips to supplement that too on the old tank. So when I moved, I, I I knew I'd need more light. This tank's 30 inches wide, and so that's that's a bit of a challenge. Most of these light sets are made for 24 inch wide tanks. Um, what I tried at first was um, those hybrid uh, T5 hybrid setups. Yes. 
and I and I upgraded to the 360x Kessel lights. I really liked the 360x's because I could tune in. They, you know, they were like the 360 WEs in most respects, but I could tune in additional red, violet, and green. And it was amazing how you could make like different colors pop by adjusting those colors. Right. Uh, that was something I, I didn't even really know. You know, I mean, if you have a reddish orange fish, you can make it like glow. Right. Uh, when, but just putting a little red light on there. So that was fun to play with. Um, but I really, I, I didn't like those hybrid fixtures. Mm -hmm. They, they were so wide and, uh, it was so hard to work on the tank with those things in the way. And so I, I just never really found myself happy with them. And uh, it also seemed, you know, I, I, the other problem I had with them was that the power consumption, that tank has one 15 amp breaker to it. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is the T5s would heat up the water, the chiller would kick on, and randomly once a week I'd come home and the breaker would trip because the load of the chiller running and the T5 lights would pop the breaker. And, and I had also added those XHO strips. So I, I had the XHOs. <laughs> I mean, I had quite a bit of light on Right, right, right. And um, so then I decided, well, I'm just going to simplify when those um, a AP um, 9Xs came out mm -hmm. um, from Castle. I, I thought, you know, these should be perfect for me. I want to turn them perpendicular to the tank and have four of them across the tank, right. but that needs an extension arm that's not out yet. Yeah. So for now, I you can see in the video how I have them, but it, it's worked pretty well. And I really like the color wise, I get a lot of the same effects I'd get with the 360X. They're simpler, they use a lot less power. Um, I really like how light they are. I mean, they only weigh two, three pounds, or yeah. they're incredibly light. Right. And that arm is really slick because you can pivot them, you know, right. up, down. I mean, it's it's almost infinite angles that you can mount them at. Right. And I thought that was pretty slick, so. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of those, right? just in general. Uh, like on the one tank that I had, I actually, uh, they were the Prime HDs, where, again, just with that little boomerang kind of arm where, um, again, the nice thing about it, whether it was high, low, I, t I took the one tank and I was able to, with, we'll say, four lights, you know, um, relatively small, obviously, um, really able to provide a mixed reef tank with mixed reef lights. So I'd jack it down low and turn the power up on one and, you know, the, the, the hungry acros just loved it right where again you had something like and you feel your hammer well i put up higher and you just let it dissipate yeah. and i would big fan in general yeah. of kind of i'll call it independent lighting for the lack of a better word yeah. so so the the lighting you have now are you really glad that you went to it right yeah i i think once they have that extension arm and i can get them but now it's it's what i i mean to me what i always liked about you know metal halide pendants or now led pendants was the access to the tank right i i never liked canopies and you right. know these panels and that because it, it's just too hard to get into the tank right and you know you walk by your tank you see something fell over you, you want to just reach right. in there and get it you don't want to have to yes. move a canopy or i mean i've got the screen top and that that's a little bit of a an annoyance to have to get past but right. it's it's perfect you know you, you as long as the lights aren't there nothing big and heavy you can get in and get right. the job done so right 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 so, um, so in general terms, the, the last tank that you had, it was set up in the middle of the house, basically, or, you know, where yeah. everybody could see it. Same with this one? Yeah, it's, it's right in the living room. It's between the living room and the kitchen, so. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, with the kids, now that they're growing, uh, any issues as far as, you know, hook shot into the tank or whatever? No, I haven't, I haven't had that. I, I did, you know, I mean... My son, you know, 
nerf suction cup gun shot at the tank a few times, but yeah. So <laughs> yeah, nerf's okay. Changed it to BB. <laughs> Got a different story. Yeah, going on, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. Well, fortunately, he, he he gets it, and you know, we've actually I, I sent you that video of the uh, the plant tank that we set up. Right. So you know, that's that was one of our lockdown things was we set up this little plant tank together. So.